Larry Gowan has been one of the lead singers of Styx since 1999. Big shoes to fill stepping in for Dennis DeYoung, but man, has he done amazing work. Of course, us Canadians, we know him for a strange animal, criminal mind, moonlight desires. He was big stuff in the 80s, and Lawrence was everywhere, or Larry, because we're Canadians, and we know him as Lawrence, Larry, or Gowan, and or. In this one, and keep in mind, there's a new part that just came out on our big channel, Rock History Music. The link is in the description if you want to see that as well. In this one, we talk about a really strange encounter Lawrence had with a gentleman who was really living the life of that song, Criminal Minds. It was a strange encounter at an airport. and was very eerie, and he remembers it clearly. Also, we talk about being a Canadian in an American band and a lot more with Lawrence Gowan on Rock History Canada. Lawrence Gowan, known professionally as Gowan, is a Canadian singer-songwriter and keyboardist celebrated for his very dynamic presence on stage and powerful vocals. He was born November 22, 1956 in Glasgow, Scotland. He moved to Canada at a young age. Gowan first garnered fame in the early 1980s with solo hits like A Criminal Mind, Strange Animal, and Moonlight Desires. Gowan first got major attention from Styx when he was opening for them, which just to keyboard. His power as a vocalist and on stage has really helped revitalize Styx. The criminal Mind, that airport uh, shackles story, um, yeah. that would... That's like a holster. That's like a your. That's like something in your holster story. That, that that's a song that that has o- over the years. It, it, it's it's amazing the response that I get from people of all ages. And you know, so for example, I I had, I had a guitarist Danny that played with me for a short time who um, uh, said that when he saw that video, he was only eight years old and it terrified him. <laughs> And it's, yeah. look at it, it's light and campy, really. But to a kid, that was, to him, it was terrifying. And I've heard that on a few other occasions. Um, <clears throat> I told you the part with, with Tommy Shaw wanting me to play that song first when I, when I walked in the room to work with Sticks. Uh, Nova Scotia, and we were just there a few weeks ago, in Halifax, in the Halifax airport, there was a kind of a roundabout uh, seating area. So you weren't you weren't right beside you were kind of the next person to you it was it was a circular thing so that you had to turn like this to the next person. So I'm sitting there and uh, waiting on the flight and this fella here leans over leans back like this to me and says, "Hey buddy," and I heard he had a Newfoundland accent. He says, "Hey buddy, you, you you're the guy that wrote that Criminal Mind song." And I said, "Yeah, that's me." And he says he says he goes. I got to tell you something. That song is my whole life. That's my whole life. And he was maybe only about maybe late twenties, so there wasn't much difference in our ages. And he said, "And I've listened to that song every single day." And I said, "Oh, great! Well, thanks very much." You know, like this. And and then he got choked up, and he went every single day and i saw him starting to tear up and I'm like, hey that's okay that's good you know I'm glad you like it and he goes you don't understand it's my whole life and then he stood up and i saw that he was shackled at the at the ankles to uh and he was wearing cuffs to uh, an officer beside him and he was being transferred from somewhere in nova scotia back to a a, a jail in uh in St. John's, Newfoundland. In fact, last summer, I actually stood outside that jail. I didn't. I wish I knew knew his name or something, but I stood there and just thought back, you know, decades ago when that guy said that, and thought about where his life might have eventually gone. So that, that's that's one of the most emotional interactions I ever had with someone about a song. The inspiration for that, I think, is is. There's a long arc to it that finally culminated in, in a moment. I think, you know, there, there was, there were, there were minor delinquencies that I dabbled with as an early as an early teenager. <laughs> nothing, nothing spectacular, so I won't go into that. But basically, things that uh, things that you you eventually learn your lesson from, or you move on with. You know, I learned my lesson and uh, decided I'd be, I, I'll make a better musician than that. I'm just not all that gangster. And uh, so in the early 
eighties, I think in eighty three it was at the Canadian National Exhibition. They had a, they had a, an exhibit taken from Kingston Penitentiary. They had actually trans, transported a, an entire cell from the Kingston Penitentiary, and this was a display in the I think in the uh, I think it was in the automotive building at the at the X, and there was nobody looking at this thing. And it was just like people were passing by and looking at other Canadian things, you know, the snowbirds or things like that. And, uh, but it fascinated me. And there was one guy there kind of overseeing the exhibit. And I just struck up a conversation with him. And he was a re retired, recently retired uh, prison guard from Kingston Penitentiary. And he said, um, we started talking about recidivist because he'd known some of these guys he said, some of them have become my friends. I've known them for decades. And that conversation just got, I got deep into that. And I said, just don't know what it would be like to have to sit. He goes, well, get in there. So I went into this cell and he slammed the door behind me. Just closed you know, the actual cell door. And it jarred me. And he, he said, what does that feel like? And I said, yeah, not good. And I went over and sat down on the bed. They had a bed, an actual bed dummy that someone had made up a paper mache thing. I sat there and he said, so imagine now our conversation goes this way. Yeah. Through the bars, right? And I had that melody at home. Da, 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 da. Oh, here it is right here. Hang on. I've always got my piano here in the room. <laughs> you see? Ta da. Yeah. Um, good for so, you. Yeah. So uh I had that melody and I didn't know what that song should be about. But when I got home the next morning, I woke up and I went, it's about that. It's about a criminal mind. And the lyrics it fell out of my mouth within, it's one of those things within 20 minutes I had that. I had the melody already, but the, the lyrics just came and I realized this is going to be really good. My brother, funny enough, Terry came home at lunchtime that day and I just finished it around 1130 and I played it for him and he went, that's a hit those stereotypes because those are going to happen anyway oh absolutely yeah there was one year there where i tried to uh what touring with sticks where i really tried to up the stereotypes so i would have for example my water bottle on stage with the maple syrup bottle i wore a uh, a canadian uh, uh mounted police a mounted red coat on stage etc and yeah people enjoyed the fact that my i guess my canadianism um if that's a word was uh, was front and center, and I loved all I loved all the cliche and all the all all the uh, stereotypical things that people assumed of Canadians, and I helped to reinforce them with my diligent watching of every every hockey game that could possibly you know <laughs> go into places and demand that the television be switched from baseball to the hockey game, and people would be like, "Oh, we know where you're from," and uh, yeah, so I, I lived up to it. Funny enough. We <laughs> sticks came to Canada, and um, I'll tell you, here's a little story about that. Um, I bought that Mountie coat from an actual Mountie who had retired. Now I don't know if that that's necessarily legal that they're allowed to do that, but I bought that coat from him, and it was authentic, not just a costume. I wore it throughout the entire tour. Came to Canada, and we were playing in British Columbia, and a couple of uh, guys. Uh, Police officers wanted to confiscate it from us at the end of the show. Said, you're not allowed to do that. And our tour manager, George, who tour managed, you know, Super Tramp and uh, Ringo Starr, and Barbara Streisand and Stevie Wonder, he's well aware of what's allowed and what's not allowed. You know, he's, he knows a lot of that because he's come up against uh, law enforcement a few times. And I, I um, He said, it's on stage. It's clearly a costume that he is wearing. No, we know who he is. He's Canadian, and he shouldn't be wearing that on stage. And they wanted to confiscate it. And I like the fact that it was our American tour manager that stood up for me and said, you're not opening that case. You're not getting that thing out of there. That's our property, and we're leaving. And then I got a little bit of a reprimand, but I, I felt like such an outlaw for it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, by the way, someone had told me, says, oh, well, you know, people, his friends call him Larry. Yeah. Because I remember when the, the album came out, I was working at K-Light. We played, you know, uh, Moonlight Desires. We played all that stuff. And, uh, uh, and it started then. 
people started saying his name is Lawrence. So do your friends call you Larry? I need to know. This is inquiring minds. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. And, and thank God, John, that you're asking the deep, hard-hitting questions. <laughs> Too many fluff balls going by lately. Um, I'm going to back up one second about that previous story, because I'm going to say this. I never wore a Mountie coat off stage. okay? Just so you understand that. If we get people start commenting on that. I'm not going to ask you if you still have it, because we're, we're moving on. We're moving never on. mind. So, yeah. So what, whenever, when I was growing up, I remember when I started playing hockey, uh, we were in the dressing room. I was about eight years old, and uh, our coach went around the dressing room and he said, "He, he goes, okay, everybody, tell tell us your name, just your first name, and we'll, uh, you know, everybody say hi." Okay, the first guy, hi, hi, my name's Joe. Hey, Joe, how you doing? What's my name? What's your name? I'm Ken. Hi, Ken, how you doing? What's your name? John. John, how are you, John? What's your name? Lawrence. So, uh, Lawrence. Lawrence. Well, Lawrence is not a hockey player's name. Your name's Larry. Larry. Okay. So, hi, Larry. <laughs> Boom. And it went around the room like that. And I came out, I remember telling my mom, I said, you know, they, they call, they're calling me Larry, but not Lawrence. And she said, oh, yeah, they say that a lot over here. You know, if your name's Lawrence, I'll say Larry. And I said, uh, okay, so basically I had hockey friends that called me Larry. My family called me Lawrence, and all my school friends called me Lawrence. But then I had other guys on my hockey team in school that started calling me Larry. So then... Roll the clock ahead when I had my solo thing. I dropped first name entirely because in the 80s, as you know, John, you were only allowed to have one name. So I, I, I stuck by that law. And uh, and then in the early 90s, because the record we did, Lawrence Gallon, but you can call me Larry, sounded so different from, I moved on into the 90s era or that's what that al album really did. By, by dropping a lot of the theatrics and be, you know, writing more songs on acoustic guitar, co-writing, et cetera, that our manager, Ray Daniels, who managed Rush, um, when we were coming for an album title, he said, uh, he, he, he said, oh, no, we decided, let's use my full name. So Lawrence Gallum we're going to use. And then he made a joke. He said, yeah, but, you know, because we still played hockey. Actually, Getty Lee and even Alex Lifeson played hockey with us. And they would call me Larry at the games. <laughs> so he says, you know, <laughs> but people can still call you Larry. So suddenly I said, yeah, Lawrence Gallon, but you can call me Larry. And that became the, the album title. And it got people like yourself and Kay Light, et cetera, started using that as a bit of a joke, which was great because it, it helped to kind of distance me a little bit from the mullet of the 80s and move into the singer song. Hey, you were sporting that. Don't you dare backtrack on that. There's not nothing wrong with that. Oh no, no. I I, I bid I bid a tearful farewell to my mullet in oh. 1990 when they were again we're, we're coming back to, to criminality. They were outlawed in the 90s. They suddenly they became Joe Dirt material. Remember, if you want to donate to the channel, there are links in the description. It's a PayPal link. You can also join our Patreon. You'll get early access to all our videos. And we have a swag store with Rock History Canada, Rock History Book, or Rock History Music. Logos all over them. Coats, caps, T-tops, and T-shirts. And remember, subscribe to our channel, share our videos, comment on them, and like them as well. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Canada. Mm -hmm.